Today I'm going to make a video about a refugee hearing, what happens during a refugee hearing. A lot of the times I've noticed that the clients that come see us and want to make a refugee claim in Canada often think that it's only a question of filing uh, paperwork, explaining the story, and then a decision is going to be made by the Canadian government to give them refugee status. A lot of my clients actually don't realize that <clears throat> there is a refugee hearing process. So there's actually going to be a hearing in a in a hearing room at the refugee protection division obviously before it was in person and now most of the time it's virtual there are some cases where uh it's mandatory that it be in person or if technology is a little bit complicated for certain um, claimants then the the board will recommend that it be in person but most of them are virtual and it's a court court proceeding it's recorded there is a board member a lot of people refer to it as the judge but given that the refugee protection division is an administrative tribunal um, their official title are board members uh, the claimants are present there's going to be interpreters present if it's required so in the language of interpretation and there be a representative for the claimants which could either be an immigration consultant or an immigration lawyer uh, those are the only two um, types of professionals that are allowed to represent clients at the Immigration and Refugee Board, specifically at the Refugee Protection Division for refugee claims. <clears throat> and um, in some cases, but this is rare, there might be the Minister's Council, uh, which is the, the party representing immigration. Uh, but this tends to happen um, if there's a reason why they want to intervene. But in most of the, most of the cases, uh, it's the claimants, inter the interpreter, if uh, one is needed, um, the represent representative for the claimants, lawyer or immigration consultant, and the board member. Some claimants are self represent themselves. I think that's pretty rare, um, but it does happen. Um, now, the court hearing, the refugee claim hearing, is being recorded. Uh, it's recorded for different reasons. Uh, first, because in the event that um, there's an issue about during the hearing, an issue comes up. For example, uh, the claimant feels like they didn't have enough time to explain their story or they, didn't, they weren't asked the right questions or there was some sort of procedural fairness, some sort of procedure in the hearing that wasn't done properly, then that is the way to contest that we have the recording, there's ways to go about it. If the claimant wants to file an appeal at the Refugee Appeal Division and the representative needs to review in detail what happened, if it's a different representative or even if it's the same representative, by <clears throat> requesting the transcript from, well, the hearing CD from the, the RPD, then uh, what we could do is we can transcribe them, have, a, have them transcribed, and we can have line by line everything that was said by all the parties to be able to make our arguments. Um, the other thing that's important to know about the court hearing is that it's super important. So a lot of people unfortunately think that they're going to write their story. Um, you know, people come to Canada for all kinds of reasons. People escape to Canada for all kinds of reasons. And, you know, some people are genuinely afraid for their lives, but it might not necessarily fit into the definition of convention refugee. Um, there's a lot of guidelines, a lot of policies, and you know there's case law that uh, determines what makes uh, a, a claimant to be approved to be a convention refugee. Now, you know a lot of people read online forums or blogs. <clears throat> they hear stories from, um, you know, my friend did that, or I know somebody's cousin walked through the border, made a refugee claim, and you know now they're a citizen, super happy, and you know I hear these things all the time. But it's actually a very, you know, making a refugee claim and going through the whole process is actually a very complicated process. And everything that you do from the beginning will matter. Every, everything you say from the moment that you cross the border or you land at the airport and you make your claim, or you came out as a visitor, a few months later you decide to make your claim. Everything you do, everything you write, everything you say in front of an officer um, will matter. Because later on, when you go to court, all of that information is there. And sometimes the court hearing can be literally two, three years later, sometimes four years later. And if you forgot what you said, if what you said was a lie, if you omitted information, 
um, then it could be a big problem. So that's why it's very, very important that, you know, obviously some people come and, you know, they're just escaping for their life. They're, they're afraid they're going to, you know, they're, they have death threats or they're going to be tortured or they're being discriminated. And of course, maybe they didn't do the whole research. But the hope is that they would fall on a representative, uh, ideally an, an experienced uh, immigration representative that will tell them from the beginning, look, if this is why you're afraid, you need to demonstrate this, 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 and you need to have ideally this types of documentation. You will have a hearing. All these questions will be asked, and we need also to look at your history of what you did after you left your country, because if you went around to different countries or you went on vacation or uh, you came to Canada, but you made your claim two years later, or you wrote your story, but you forgot important dates, or you said you filed a police report and you don't have the report, then, you know, if you don't address that from the beginning and you leave that at, at the end when you have your refugee hearing, <clears throat> it's going to play a lot on your credibility. And if there's some things in your story that they are not working, that doesn't make sense to the board member, it's going to be very easy for the board member to say, well, you know, you didn't have this in that document or this didn't make sense. And during the hearing, when you testified, you said the opposite of what you wrote. So I'm going to deny you. So, you know, this is not to say that, you know, if you hire an immigration um, lawyer that's experienced and you tell him, yes, I have all these documents. Yes, this is my doesn't mean you necessarily it's going to be approved. It depends what 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 your story is, what happened to you. And when I say the word story, you know, it might feel like I'm saying something like an invented uh, story, but the story is what happened to you, right? Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people make up stories, right? They, they hear things, they want a better future for themselves or for their children, and they lie. They lie about, you know, something that happened to them, uh, and they come and they make a claim, and then years later they have a hearing, and they eventually get refused. I would say a lot of them get refused, if not, you know, uh, I wouldn't say most of them, but, you know, it's not easy to, to win a refugee claim, and... and in a way, it should be like that because this is one of the best countries in the world, I think. And uh, there's legitimate, real people, vulnerable people that are, you know, fleeing their countries. And it's unfortunate when people come and just make up a story or they make a, plain, a claim to get a work permit, even though they know their claim is going to be refused. And then applicants who actually claim and who actually deserve are, are waiting in the line because this is happening. So, um so the hope is that when people enter Canada uh, or, and, and they're, or they're here and they, you know, something happens in their home country and they want to make a claim, the hope is that they fall on somebody that has experience in making these claims that could listen to their story, get all the information and say, I think most likely you would have a good chance or you might have a chance, but it's going to be difficult or this, this does not meet the criteria of making a refugee claim. You will most likely be refused. Obviously, as a lawyer, we're not allowed to guarantee any anything. We cannot say you have 98% chance or you have 50% chance. This is not our job, this is not our profession, and we're actually ethically not allowed to do that. So if you go see a refugee lawyer or an immigration consultant that says, oh yes, this is a slam dunk, I'm gonna take your case and for sure you're gonna win. Very easy for people to say that, especially that refugee hearings, it could take years to have a hearing so very easy to say that grab your money and then two three years later you're living in canada you're working um maybe you even have children and you have your your refugee hearing you have your hearing and the judge refuses that you turn to your consultant or lawyer and say well what happened and they'll be like well it's not my fault i mean they you know it's the, the board member that makes the decision so very very important to to do proper research, to hire somebody or speak to somebody that has experience. Because like I said earlier, if you need to demonstrate a lot of things. So first of all, you have to demonstrate that you have a direct risk to your life, um, risk of death, risk of torture. And if it's, for example, persecution uh, based on the fact that you're part of a social group or a political group, it can't just be, you know, some sort of generalized discrimination. It has to be systemic, repeated discrimination that amounts to persecution. Um, you have to have evidence that you tried to go to your government, you tried to go to the police, you tried to get help. It's called state protection. And you weren't given that help. Or if you didn't go because the system is corrupt, police is corrupt, 
you have to be able to explain that if you're asked questions. And as as your lawyer, if that is the case, if the case is that, you know, in your country, you absolutely cannot go to the authorities, it's our job to pull out country conditions, documentation, international reports to demonstrate that, look, in this country, you cannot trust the police. Okay, that's number two. Number three, you have to demonstrate that you don't have an internal flight alternative, IFA. So this means that, for example, if you're leaving India, you have to, and you're from New Delhi, you have to explain why. If somebody wants to hurt you in New Delhi, why can't you go to Bombay or why can't you go to Mumbai? Why, you know, India is a big country with a lot of people. How, why can't you go, are you not able to relocate somewhere where nobody's able to hurt you? So that's called an internal flight alternative. So a lot of refugee cases, you'll see that the board member will say, yes, I believe you have a risk. Yes, I believe the government can help you but I think you have an internal flight alternative. I think you can go somewhere else safely in your country because the goal of the Refugee Protection Division is not just to say yes to everybody. If everybody who had problems would come to Canada, it would not be possible. So when people are facing problems in their country, the, you know they have to go to their own government. They have to try to go in another city and live somewhere. And if you didn't do that or couldn't do that, you have to demonstrate why. So, for example, I've had a lot of cases where the country is big and, you know, I've had women that have been abused by their husbands for years and um, they, they don't want to, they left the country because they're afraid. And, you know, sometimes, we, you know, a board member might say, well, you could go live in another city, but our argument could be, well, yes and no. Do they speak the language, the dialect of the other cities? If they're a single mom, if they have mental health issues, how are they gonna go and live in another town after they've lived this systemic kind of abuse uh, and, and domestic violence was in their life for so long? It's, you can't just say, well, just take your children or you know, just you by yourself go somewhere else. You know, in certain countries as, as a single woman living, going somewhere where you're not, you know, you've never been, it could be very problematic. So there's a lot of nuances and there's a lot of um, different ways to, Different, different people have different stories and we have to look at the specifics of your case. So you have these three things that are hopefully uh, an experienced immigration lawyer can explain to you. The next thing is your documentation. It's very important that if you're, if you're somewhere now and you're afraid something's gonna, you know, your, your plan is to come to Canada and make that claim or you're in Canada and something's happening in your country. Um, what are the documents that support your claim? Obviously, when you're in a state of emergency, you're not going to think, let me collect this document, let me collect that document. But when you make your refugee claim, in the initial part, you don't necessarily have to have those documents. But what we tell our clients is, look, give us everything you have, whatever you have already, and it, you know, it, it's a good document that supports your case, we will submit it. Either as soon as we file it or two months after we file the claim, we'll put it together. But later on, when you're going to have your refugee claim two years, one year later, before the hearing, there's a specific timeline by which we can submit these documents. It's called submitting disclosure documentation. Now, there is time to prepare these documents, but our philosophy at the office has always been whatever documents you have available now, we want to submit it right away. Why? Because first of all, it shows it moves towards you having a genuine case because you have it and you give it. And nowadays, because um, the RPD is trying to process cases a little bit faster because there's such a big backlog, if your file is really well prepared, maybe it might be, um, it, it might go into the, it's called the streamline um, for streamlining cases that might be approved without a hearing. It's rare, but it happens. But I find overall, <clears throat> if we submit uh, documents from the beginning and then we update the file later before the hearing, it just kind of shows this credibility. It shows that we're consistent with everything we're saying. Now, having said that, there are, I've done claims where there's zero documents, you know, uh, women being abused, for example, there's, you know, maybe she never went to the police. Maybe she never went to, to the doctor. Um, I've had a lot of cases where people had no documentation and all on, the only documentations we had was the country conditions and the person's story, because that's also evidence you're, you're testifying. So there's the documents and then there's your testimony. So, you know, it's not mandatory that you have tons of documentation, but I always tell people, um, 
think of everything you can give to us that'll support your case. So if you were harassed by a specific group of people, did they call you? Did they text message you? Did they send you a letter? Did you keep a copy of the letter? Did you keep a screenshot? Don't delete your text messages. Did they send you messages on Messenger? Take a screenshot of that. If you went to the police, get a, we need a copy of the police report. You didn't get a copy, find somebody that's still in your country, try to go to that, call the police station from here and say, look, I need a copy of these incidents. Uh, if you were injured and you went to the hospital, you went to see a doctor, doctor's letter, medical report. So people underestimate the amount of documentation and evidence that they can get, and they underestimate that um, the Refugee Protection Division wants these documents. I'm always kind of, I mean, I shouldn't say the word amazed, but when I, you know, when clients, uh, we work with them for the refugee camp and we give them the list of documents and they're just kind of like, why, why do you need all this? Well, it's like, well, how are we going to prove your case? We, we, you know, you have to make your case. We have to build your case together. And so in, in some cases when they don't have the documents, I tell them, look, do you have people that that know about this situation, that saw what happened. Can they write affidavits, get them translated and get we get them certified? Would they be willing to testify over the phone during your hearing? So, you know, we try our best with what we have, but ultimately if we don't have the right documentation or not enough documentation, or even if we have tons of documentation, the, the next important thing is your testimony. When you're going to testify at your refugee hearing, uh, that is when kind of everything comes together because in your basis of claim when you're going to be when we're going to be uploading you know all the forms and there's it's called a narrative it used to be called the personal information form now it's the basis of claim form it's your narrative that's what the in law we refer to it your narrative which is your story um <clears throat> you write it it's you know on the on the form, I think it's like one page. You know, when we do it with our clients, depending of the story, sometimes we end up writing like four, five, six pages if there's a lot of details and if our clients remember all the details. Um, but when you go to the hearing, that you know, I always tell my clients that hearing, this this is about you. It's not about me. It's not about the board member. It's not about the interpreter. It's about you. And this is the time for you to really share your story from your heart. Even though maybe you did your narrative by yourself, you did, you know, you didn't put everything, or maybe you, your representative didn't do a good job. Maybe you, you don't have documentation. You, you know, you were nervous. You didn't know. You didn't prepare. You hired a lawyer late or whatever. Um, this is the the opportunity to really speak from the heart and explain everything. And you know, unfortunately, with with refugee claims, often it's really really difficult. I always tell my team at the office, you know, when we have refugee uh, clients. It takes us many months to really actually get to know them and get to know their story because people that have lived through a lot of trauma and a lot of difficulties, they're in a new country, they're talking to a professional, even though we're very welcoming, very warm, at the end of the day, we're strangers. And it's always been like that where the first meeting we have, I ask a lot of questions, I get all the information, I'm being a little bit like pushy. They give me some information, but I, you know, a month later, my team will be like, Mary, you know what? I was talking to the client and this come, came up and this came up. And how come they didn't tell us in the beginning? I'm like, it's normal. We're strangers. It's hard. They're, they're traumatized. Maybe they don't remember certain things. And, you know, my team will tell me, oh, you know, Mary, I asked some questions and they're crying and it's hard. Can you help me? I'm like, yes, I will help you. And, you know, sometimes I'll get on the call and I'll talk to the clients myself and I'll tell them, look, it's unfortunate. It's difficult because they're getting re-traumatized. But we try to find ways. We try to tell them, look, this is for you. If you don't tell us everything now, we can't help you. Once we're in the courtroom, if we get new information, we can't help you. It's better that we know everything. So we prepare our clients for the hearing. So we do kind of mock interviews. We ask because the board member is going to start uh, the hearing and they're the ones that are going to ask most of the questions. It could be an hour, two hours, three hours. And they're going to, you know, I've seen refugee hearings where the board member could be like, I'm very familiar with the facts of this case. I've read everything. I just have a couple of questions. I would say that's kind of like the exception. Usually they really go like, where were you born? What do you do? Da, 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 da. And then at some point you, you see that they're getting into the, the, the details of everything. You know, okay, you said you were, you left Afghanistan, you were afraid, but why did you go to Italy for, for two weeks? And then you went to the States and then you came here. Or, okay, you, you left Israel because this was happening, but you didn't come right away. And why didn't you go to the police station? And then this is, you know, 
you know, board members will often sometimes, you know, they'll be very casual, very friendly. They're like, yes, I've read the materials. But in fact, like some of them have read like everything and they already highlighted everything that's kind of wrong and they're kind of testing you. So our job is to, you know, it's not to tell you what to say. We never do that because this is your story. This is your life. You know, I always tell clients, you talk from the heart. Our job is to make sure that you are not scared to say certain things and you feel confident and you try to remember as many things as possible and review your history, review what you've written. Um, I always tell clients when I prepare them, don't lie during the hearing and don't guess. If you don't know something, just say, I'm sorry, I don't know, I don't remember, it's been a very long time. And clients always kind of get like, oh really? Because it's like kind of like, it's like when we want to protect ourselves, it's so obvious that maybe we should lie or maybe we'll guess something. But I tell them, look, some of these things happened to you five, six, seven, ten years ago, or they happened to you last year, but you're traumatized. You don't remember, or you might not remember on the spot. You're afraid. A lot of our clients have never been in this kind of formal setting. I find now it's a little bit easier because it's virtual, even though sometimes it's not good. Because for cases that are very, very difficult, I feel the board member doesn't really feel um, the pain and doesn't connect. But for a lot of these clients, even whether it's virtual or in person, they've never been in this setting of like an official setting. It's being recorded. It's formal. You know, when things were in, uh, when hearings were in person and I would go, even in the beginning as a young lawyer, I was intimidated because everything is so kind of like rigid and structured and you know, these people are going to decide like your future and your life, you know, so it's intimidating. I mean, for me now, it's, you know, it's the opposite of intimidating. Like that's when I feel at my best. I do feel intimidated in the sense that I, I want to make sure that I don't miss anything and I'm there for my client. But I can only imagine, you know, these, you know, these claimants that have lived th through so much and there's somebody here asking them questions and some board members are kind and gentle but some of them are just you know as their personalities are kind of rough um and you, you kind of don't see where they're going and sometimes they, they can ask a question where it actually makes the clients feel really bad so um it's important to be prepared for that so that's why i prepare my clients i tell them look the board members doing their job you know they're trained for this, but they don't know you. They might not even know that much about the country you're coming from. And you know, it happens. Some some board members are junior juniors, you know, some of them have no idea where certain countries are. Maybe they read about it before. So it's it's up to you to share your story, to tell them how what it's like in your country, what it's like in your culture. And then add to that if there's an interpreter. When there's an interpreter, hearings are always usually two, three times longer. And sometimes the interpretation doesn't flow very well because you got to do short sentences. Then the interpreter has to translate and, you know, things can get lost in translation. Um, so it's important to be prepared for the hearing. There's a lot that comes with that. So that's why we, we spend a lot of time explaining to our clients what's going to happen during the hearing. We tell them, for example, if you don't remember something, you know, don't guess, don't lie. But also just say, I'm sorry, it was a long time ago. I don't remember. I think it was in the summer. I think it was in winter. Or sorry, I just don't remember. I've never had a board member be like, how come you don't remember? You know, um, obviously, if it's like an important, significant date, it might look a little bit. But at the end of the day, if you don't remember, you, I always tell them just be honest, straightforward. Board members want to see like people that are straightforward, honest and even when you do all that, it doesn't necessarily mean your claim is going to be approved. It's going to depend on all the evidence. You could be a very nice person. You could be a very good person. You could have lived through a lot of things, but doesn't mean your refugee claim is going to be refused. It really depends if it's a direct risk, if you tried to get the help from your government, and if you don't have an uh, internal flight alternative. And, and then the direct risk is going to depend on your evidence, right? So, you know, I've had clients come and tell me, oh, I'm, I'm from this island and I got a bunch of threats and I want to make, okay, who threatened you? When? Do you have evidence? I don't have anything. I don't have, you know, so it could be true, but how are we going to prove it? Right? So in those cases, I tell people, look, with everything you're telling me now, I don't think the chances are very good. And, you know, and as lawyers, it's a little bit, it's hard because we're accom accompanying people in their refugee claims. We're not telling the story for them. So we can only do what, what we have. So, you know, sometimes I have to tell people, look, tell me a little bit more, like, why did you come here? What's going on? And sometimes when we dig a little deeper, we're like, okay, so you really came here because 
you want a better life for your children. The, you know, where you were, it was corrupt. The economy wasn't good. So I have to explain to them, look, these are not grounds for refugee claim. Maybe there's other options. Did you think about studying? Did you think about immigrating? Um, sometimes if they've been in Canada for a long time, they're established, they have minor children, maybe it's a humanitarian compassionate. And it's important to know that, you know, a lot of people kind of just jump in and make these refugee claims because when you make a refugee claim, they can't send you back right away. You get a removal order that's not enforceable, but you, you can stay, you get a work permit, your kids can study, you can get a uh, financial assistance from the government. And there's, you know, there's this, it's always, since I started practicing, people, you know, talk about this and then they're like, well, yeah, I wanted to work, so I make a refugee claim. But then what happens is so your refugee claim is refused and now what do you do? Your removal order is now enforceable. They can deport you from Canada. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you have children or not. Uh, you know, it could be very uh, complicated and people don't realize, oh, well, why are they going to kick me out now? But I have a valid work permit for my refugee claim. But OK, you have that. But that doesn't mean that CBSA cannot remove you. A lot of people don't understand or don't not that they don't listen, but it's very overwhelming. They apply for a refugee claim. They get all these documentation, removal order, this, deportation order, all this stuff that says, if this happens, this will be this. We're taking your passport. You know, it says everywhere. If you're refused, you, we will ask you to leave. But nobody really reads the fine print. And I'm sure officers are probably saying that to people. But, you know, people have traveled. They're, they have children. They're, you know, they don't, they don't understand. So they make a refugee claim. Sometimes really, like, just like, I just want a work permit. And then when they come and see me, they're like, okay, now I did a humanitarian compassion application because I've been here five years, but the officer says that I, it was refused because I'm not credible. Well, I understand why, because officers don't like when there's this immigration history, when they have seen people try to do everything to stay here uh, when they don't have grounds for it, right? So they, you know, officers are like, okay, you made a refugee claim and it was a fake story. Now you did an HNC, it's based on something else, doesn't match what you said in your refugee claim. So, you know, it's, and and you don't wanna to get to a point where your immigration history is so long and complex that sometimes I feel officers are now just punishing the clients. They're saying, no, I, we don't want this type of person in Canada, you know? So that's why I tell people, um, you know, you have to think really long and carefully before you make an immigration application because everything stays in the system you know some people will tell me like oh i applied for a visitor visa and i put this information it got refused and now i'm gonna apply and say something else and it's like okay but do you know that all that information stays in the system and they will they're gonna look at that and everything you do in the future is gonna be based on that and they're like oh really they know yes they know so you know all this to say that you know a refugee hearing is very complicated a refugee claim is very complicated and it's really important to get proper advice before filing it and if you filed it and you didn't get the proper advice consult with somebody who knows sometimes i've counseled clients to say look you should have never done a refugee claim you should withdraw this oh but they're going to ask me to leave yes but maybe there's something else we can do for you or maybe you should withdraw and leave and try to come back because if you don't and you just keep going and abusing the resources of the government and the system, it's not going to end well. If it's not a genuine claim, don't make the claim. And unfortunately, some people don't, you know, don't know. A lot of people think like, you know, it, it's funny. They come in my office and they're like, yeah, I'm here from, you know, this, that country and I don't want to go back. Okay. Okay. Are you afraid to go back? Yes. And they're like, okay, why? Well, you know, there's no jobs and you know, it's not safe. It's like, oh, okay, well, this is not a refugee claim. Like, tell me more, tell me more about your story. And then, you know, sometimes we dig and then something would come up and I'll say, okay, so this is why you left. So this might be, but on the other hand, it could also be, okay, no, this is not, you know, you don't qualify for refugee. You know, let's look at your, you know, let's look at everything else in your life. Um, maybe there's another category. If there isn't, I have to tell you, it's better to leave. So um, I hope this video is helpful. Uh, I know there's, you know, it's hard out there to find information about what happens at during a refugee hearing, unless you've been, you're experienced in doing them for many years and you've seen kind of what happens with different board members, you know, then um, 
then you won't know what happens, you know, and it's important, you know, when, when we have clients that consult us on a refugee claim, we talk to them a lot about what happens after we file the claim. And we have to remind them many times. It's only months later that, you know, they're like, oh, there's a court hearing. Oh, I did, you know, and you have to remind them because often traumatized, um, sometimes there are mental health issues. We might have to get a mental health assessment. So we remind them of the process to prepare them. We really accompany them throughout the process um, to make sure that, you know, they understand what they're doing. And, um, and like I said, every application you do in immigration matters. That's going to stay in your history. So the more consistent, straightforward, and honest you are, um, the better uh, your, your, your process in Canada is going to be. I hope this was helpful. And thank you.